Man. Um, Wes mentioned that this week that we'll... Um, what did Wes mention? This week we're launching uh, a new Living Water app, and part of that is going to be a, a 25 days of, of reflection and um, scripture, an opportunity uh, for you to take the next 25 days to lead up to Christmas to focus and hone in. And, and I, I wanted to take a moment to say that Advent is not just the theme that leads up to Christmas presents. But Advent is, it's a, it's a mark on the calendar that the church puts there to say the reason that this time of, that this holiday called Christmas matters is because it reminds us that Jesus Christ came to earth. And the advent is the arrival. It is the preparation for the arrival of Jesus. And over the course of advent, we look at those characteristics that Jesus Christ makes possible for those who trust him. Love, joy, hope, and peace. And I think it's important because I don't know if there could be a more countercultural um, way to approach this season of the year than to say that while the theme song of this season for most people is busyness and anxiety and worry about the family members you're going to meet and how much money you have to spend on presents and the weather has changed and so we're not sure why we live in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. And all, all the things that in the midst of all of that, that we say, no, our hearts were, will center on the remembrance that Jesus is the one that brings hope and love and joy and peace. And no matter how crazy the world is around me, the theme song of my life is that God will set the tone of what happens in my heart. Anybody? Yeah. Is it just me or does no, no, nobody else deals with any of the Christmas anxiety or stuff? Is it, is it just me? It's just, oh, it's fine. We did, we did it for me. We're doing Advent for me, because I need it. Thank you, brother. We're doing it for us. The two of us, we're doing it together. Okay, okay, Paul. Um, but here's the point. You know what? The world spends billions of dollars to form and shape your heart to be motivated by all the anxiety that pushes you to want the things that the world wants you to want. Right? Billions of dollars. And Satan puts all the anxiety and stress to try to take a time that's meant to be joyful and relationally connecting to make it the most tenuous, stressful, and relationally divided time of the year. So you've got the world and you've got Satan working against everything that is good. And what a better revolution for the church to say, hell no. <laughs> like literally, hell no. You don't get to dictate the posture of my heart. How radical would it be for you just to show up, you to show up this time of the year, and there's an excess of peace and joy and love and hope that you sprinkle and deposit everywhere you go. Oh man, I'm, I'm excited about Advent because. <laughs> it's the lead up to the Super Bowl when we already know who wins. <laughs> and no commercials. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So I, I'm saying this because I really want you to see this is one of those opportunities where as the people of God, if you're a Christian, one of the things you constantly need to be aware of is how is my heart been formed by the influences of this world and how does God want to reform my heart to be in alignment with him? Advent's a phenomenal opportunity to say, God, in this season, my heart will be formed around the things that, that are good and right and true and meant to be. So next week, Advent starts. Bring your friends, bring your relatives, bring your neighbors, bring your enemies, bring the people that really annoy you because maybe God will fix them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I'm going to tell everybody that that's why you invited them next week. <laughs> so if you're new here today and got invited to church, it's because. Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Today, we're concluding a series that we began seven or eight weeks ago through this letter that is a letter written by Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus. Peter wrote this letter to an, an, a region that, um, for it to be read from church to church to church. This is how the early church was shaped and formed. It was primarily the people that had walked with Jesus would write their reflections and fire, inspired by the Holy Spirit to help people know how to understand the significance of what Jesus had done to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so this is one of those letters that gets written. And there are a couple of themes that we've pulled out to focus on over the last several weeks. And one, one of them fundamentally is this idea that Peter writes to Christians and frames their disposition or relationship to their world around them is that they are like exiles living in a, in a foreign world. Even if, even if they actually grew up in the town in which they were living, Peter understood that there's not only the physical geography that makes up a place, there's also the culture and the system that makes up a place. And certainly the places where these Christians were living was made up by very, uh, very clear systems in terms of what was good and what was to be worshiped in the Roman Empire. They had very, um, very clear parameters on the kinds of um, worship that could be performed and what kind of ethics would be rewarded. And many of them were very harmful and divisive. Uh, they rewarded the powerful and the influential and they minimized and marginalized the weak and the hurting. And Jesus's kingdom is upside down to all of that. And so those who were becoming Christians, which was no small commitment, those who were becoming Christians going through um, the process of being baptized and then regularly receiving communion, uh, both things that marked them as different than the culture around them, they were experiencing um, suffering. They didn't feel like they fed, fit in any longer because of their new way of life and the way it began to put cracks between the way of the world and the way that they were living and following Jesus. And so Peter calls them exiles. It's like, it's like moving to a new world and a new land where the food and the culture and what's normal is different than what is normal for you. And so he's, he's writing to them about how to be a witness for Jesus in that kind of environment. And after he speaks to um, slaves and um, those under government and in households, um, he's going to conclude the letter, the, the, the heart of the letter, with a focus on suffering. So uh, today we're going to talk about suffering. We're going to turn the heat up and the message is going to be an hour and 27 minutes long and we're just going to practice suffering today. That's not true. But... One thing that I do believe is true is that if there is something that universally unites us in our human experience is that everybody's going to suffer. <sighs> and there's all kinds of suffering. Uh, there's the kind of suffering that you earn. And there's the kind of suffering that you do all the right things and you still experience pain. But whichever one it is, it's gonna come for everybody. And the question isn't how do you avoid suffering? Because in fact, if I were to ask the question, um, how, how many of you believe that you've experienced um, some form of suffering in your life? Um, how many of you would say that you enjoy the seasons when you're not suffering? <laughs> how many of you, are the, is there anybody here who would say, though, that you've also seen how it is through seasons of suffering where some of the most profound things have been produced in your life? So the question isn't how do you avoid suffering. The question that Peter answers is how do we, as Christians following in the way of Jesus, how do we suffer well? 
How do we suffer well in in the way that honors and reflects the way that Jesus demonstrated suffering? So that's where we're gonna go um, today. And this message is for, this message is for you. It's for you if you're going through suffering. It's for you if you've been through suffering and you've never been able to make sense of it. And it's for you if everything's going really, really well, because I wanna say, enjoy that season. Not to, not to predict foreboding or this horrible future, but to see that there really is a sovereign goodness in the way that when, listen, in so often and almost inescapable, that when God wants to take you to another level, there's gonna be some kind of suffering, friction, tension, trial that happens in your life. How we see that and view that is going to influence significantly the outcomes of, of your life. And maybe even how many times you have to suffer over the same thing. Listen, if, you're gonna, if God wants to allow you to suffer to learn a lesson, how many of you would like to learn it the first time? <laughs> so the key verse in 1 Peter 3 and 4, which both have sections that talk about suffering. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to put together several of these sections because suffering is interwoven with what we talked about two weeks ago, which is loving and serving one another. But the key to suffering well is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 1. And I'd like us to read it out loud together. Ready, set, go. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. Here, here's the, the, the foundational reality that as we think about suffering, the way that Peter's going to describe suffering. Number one, Christ suffered. Jesus suffered. The hero, founder, foundation of the Christian faith did not have an easy, serene life. Jesus suffered. And for those of us, those of you that say, I want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, that means that part of his footsteps are the shadow of suffering. Did you know you signed up for that? (laughs) But number two, would you leave that up there? Thank you. He says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. In other words, if you're gonna suffer, there's a right way to think about suffering and notice the words that he uses, arm yourselves. What does that sound like to you? Does it sound like, well, you know, if you think about it, if, if you're not busy doing anything else? Or does it sound like there's a fight coming, arm yourself with this? Yeah, that's the idea. This is not something to be taken lightly. It is something to be taken with great significance in our lives. So we want to understand what does that mean to arm ourselves with the way of thinking that Christ thinks about suffering. So we're going to look at, uh, we're going to read some scripture. We're going to begin this section of reading in chapter 3, verse 18. (coughs) Follow along as I read from the ESV version. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, pause there for just a second. Christ suffered once for sins. Now, this is a, is a really important statement because while there is a way in which Christians suffer, can suffer like Jesus suffered, there is also a way in which Christ suffered once for sin. That's important. Because the suffering that Christ accomplished that only needed to be accomplished one time was the suffering of for no reason that he deserved, he went to the cross to endure the suffering and the penalty for sin that he didn't deserve, but he did it for someone else. Christ suffered once for sin because in order for God to be just and holy, there must be a penalty for the wickedness and the evil in this world. And some people may ask you, how does a good God allow even a wiggle? uh, wiggle? (laughs) 
All I could think about was The Wiggles. Anybody remember The Wiggles? <laughs> it was my kids' favorite show when they were little. And you want to talk about a traumatic experience. <laughs> Just watch enough of The Wiggles. Where I was going with that is that Christ suffered once for sin because God in his justness must deal with the evil, the evil and the wickedness that is present in the world. God does not turn a blind eye to evil or wickedness. God has simply in his patience given mankind an opportunity to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus Christ, to faith in God through Jesus Christ. And when one does that, then what God did by allowing Christ to be crucified on the cross was put the sins of the world on him and therefore the penalty for sin, for the sins of those who had put their faith in Christ do not get overlooked, they get dealt with on your behalf by Jesus Christ. God never looks at your sin and says, oh, you don't deserve to be punished. God looks at your sin and says, you deserve so much punishment, but because you have given your life to Jesus Christ by faith, then his punishment gets to serve as your punishment and you're now free to not have to suffer what was suffered on your behalf. And when the enemy reminds you that you deserve to be punished for what you've done, you can say yes. And rather than looking in the mirror in shame, you look to the cross with overwhelming gratitude. That's the suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. But now in this whole uh, unpacking of suffering, he gives us two pictures to help understand uh, why suffering matters. And the first is Noah, verse 20. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, commentators, you, people will ask, why did he throw in Noah and baptism in the midst of suffering? We'll come back to that, but it helps us to understand the purpose of suffering. Verse 22 says, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers that have been subjected to him. Now we look at 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Listen, you want to talk about a master class in following Jesus? Rejoice when you share Christ's sufferings. Can I give you an example of that? You do everything right, and yet somebody throws insults at you and tears you down behind your back. And you have a choice whether to curse in response to that wickedness or to bless in response to that wickedness. The way of the world says give them what they deserve. The way of the cross says give them what Christ died to make possible for them. Do you see that? How much though of your own Hmm. your own pride, your own self-righteousness, how much of your own, I'm gonna fight for myself and stick up for myself, do you have to crucify in order to bless instead of curse when someone tears you down? Guess what Jesus did? He went to the cross. And we say, I can't do you know how humbling and humiliating it would be to bless somebody who has spoken uh, about me like that? Do you know, that would, that would like kill me to speak well of somebody who's speaking so poorly about me. And Christ says, oh, I thought we were gonna walk this out together. 
And by the way, I think I did the heavy lifting because it may kill you to bless when you feel like cursing, but it actually killed me to be a blessing to those who cursed me. Anybody? Why would I love and serve my spouse when they're not loving and serving me? Why would I give somebody what they don't deserve? And Christ would say, oh, I thought you wanted to hang out because I was giving you an opportunity to know what it's like to walk with me. And by the way, if you'll enter into that, it will crucify you. But in that crucifying of yourself, there is also a glory and a fellowship that you and I will experience that you can't find any other way. Anybody? Okay, this is heavy. This is heavy stuff. But good news, that's not the point of the sermon. (laughs) Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to get to walk with you through something you know far more intimately and in extremity than I ever will. Thank you that you meet me in the midst of that and that I can know you and fellowship with you in the sorrow and the pain of suffering in ways that I can't, I can't know you any other way. that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. This is one of those in that statement, judgment began in the household of God. It's why the picture of Noah helps us understand how this fits together because Noah was in the midst of a time when God was judging the wickedness of people and Noah had to suffer through the floodwaters and the ridicule as he constructed the ark. But what, what he's saying now is let judgment begin in the household of God. In other words, let, let the church look inward to say, are we walking in obedience to God and trusting him and entrusting our souls to him? Or are we conforming to the way of the world? Let judgment begin in the house of God because we are the ones who have committed to trust him. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer, here's the key, let those, in fact, let's read this out loud together, verse 19, ready, set, go. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Father God, that's what we want to walk away with today is to know how to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking that Jesus thought so that we can entrust our souls into the hands of a faithful God and do good even when it's hard. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm gonna give you three things about suffering. Suffering has a purpose. Not all suffering is the same and suffering well receives and sees God's glory. Number one, suffering has a purpose. This is where we look at Noah and baptism in chapter three, verses 18 through 22. Why are these two stories or images brought into this lesson about suffering? Number one, because Noah gives us a picture of how suffering has a purpose. Noah gives us a picture to understand how suffering has a purpose. Why? Because Noah obeyed God even though he was being ridiculed and mocked by all of the people who were his contemporaries and peers. If you know the story of Noah, um, God says, Noah, um, the earth is wicked, really wicked, like really wicked. In fact, if you dig down deep, demons having sex with humans wickedness and God said I'm going to I'm going to wipe this slate clean and create a new beginning that you're going to be a part of. He said I'm going to do it with a flood, which by the way nobody had ever heard of a flood before, so 
Nobody knew what that was, but God said, what you need to do is build an ark. And so he gave Noah instructions to build an ark. Noah started building an ark. And as you can imagine, all the people around him began to ridicule him and mock him because he was investing all of his time and all of his resources and all of his energy into building something that was to bring safety and provision to him from something that was a threat that nobody could even fathom or imagine to bring about a new beginning that nobody thought was even necessary. And so in the midst of all of that, Noah's doing his thing, being obedient to God, and people mock him and shame him, and yet, here's the key, Noah continues to obey. Everybody say obey. Obey. God in the midst of it. Secondly, Noah shows us how to suffer well in that he continued to obey God even when he was mocked. Number three, Noah endured through the floodwaters. Here's the second part of Noah's story that helps us understand suffering. And that is that Noah endured the mocking, he endured the shame, he built the ark, and then as the floodwaters rose, everything that Noah knew, all of his life and connections and financial security and all of his, all of that, it it got destroyed. It went away. In other words, Noah trusted God through the shame. And as the story unfolds, things don't get better for Noah. They get worse for Noah. Here's the dirty little secret about suffering well. When you suffer well, it doesn't guarantee that things are going to get easier right away. And if you ever go to a church that says, if you just give some money or read this book or go to this conference and everything's going to turn around for you, can I just encourage you to run the other direction? And I'm not saying, listen, God can give you joy and peace and hope in the midst of it. But nowhere in the scripture does God say, if you just do the right thing, you're going to get what you want right away. So if you are doing the right thing and you're not seeing things turn around immediately, listen, it's not necessarily because you're in the wrong. It's just that you're still in the middle of it. And you really only have two options. That is either to short circuit the process and bail or as one gospel artist used to say, if you're going through hell, don't stop. Go through it, go through it, go through it. And then finally, the good news is, and this is an important part of that, what is suffering, is that Noah saw God's glory. That after the floodwaters receded, Noah began and was a part of a whole brand new creation that God did through him because of his faithfulness. That's why we see And that's why we understand that suffering always has a perfect purpose and that when you suffer well, when as a Christian you learn to suffer well, it is not simply so that you can learn endurance. It is also because that there is always something of God's glory on the other side. What you don't know is how long the middle is. What you do know is that there is, and as sure as Jesus Christ rose from the grave, there is an other side to your suffering when you suffer well in Jesus' name. And you don't know if you're one day, one week, one month, or one year away from it, but you can count on it as sure as the sun rises in July. You can count on it. (laughs) because you're not so sure right now, but you can count on it that as sure as the sun rises, listen, if you suffer well, there's glory on the other side. Number two, not all suffering is the same. And, and, the, and there's really, there's no easy way to say this, but there's two kinds of suffering. There's the suffering that you earn because you do dumb things. 
and there's the suffering that comes because you're walking in obedience to Jesus. Now, who's in the earned suffering because you've done dumb things club? I would like to say, I'm in that one. And hear me now, I'm not saying that you're dumb. I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm saying you would probably be the first one who would stand up and say, I don't know what I was thinking. You would probably be the one, because you're sitting here today, who would look at something that you've done and you've suffered the consequences of it and you've said, I, I, I wish I could go back and undo that. I, I don't know what I was thinking. But nevertheless, this is why the scripture says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. It is important to understand that there are two kinds of suffering and that the kind of suffering that, that I've earned because I've not walked in obedience to Jesus, it is not a meaningless suffering, but it's different. And this is the good news of what the scripture says when anybody that loves God and yet makes poor decisions. This is God's response to that in Hebrews chapter 12, verses six through seven. For the Lord disciplines the one that he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. For it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as a son. For what son is there that his father does not discipline? Listen, if you're going through pain, if you're suffering because you've made bad decisions, the pain that you're experiencing, please, 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 please hear me. It is not punishment. Because Jesus bore your punishment. And as long as you think that it's punishment, then somehow, please hear me, with all compassion, if you think that somehow God needs to punish you for what you've done, what you are saying is that the punishment Christ endured was not sufficient. And it is not just shame, it is also pride to think that somehow you need to endure something that Christ endured on your behalf. God does not punish his children, but he disciplines them because he loves them and he sees something so much more beautiful that needs to be refined in your life. And if you have to go on that merry-go-round more than once, that's probably up to you, but he'll be there with you time after time again, not punishing you, but loving you enough to shape and oftentimes heal the things that are under the surface that were motivating those decisions in the first place. I don't know anybody that wakes up in the morning and says, I want to ruin my life. <laughs> People wake up in the morning and they're hurting and they're confused and they've got pain they don't understand. And so they do something that seems out of character because they're trying to solve a problem and they don't know what the answer is. And God doesn't look at you to shame you or to beat you. He looks at you to heal you and to raise you up to new life. That's the heart of God. Somebody thank God for that. No matter how bad it is, say this with me. God does not punish me. God loves me. God does not punish me. God loves me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The other kind of suffering is the, the suffering... Um, that comes as we walk in obedience to Jesus. And Caden, if you'd come to the platform, I'm gonna, I'm gonna land the plane here. You know what it means when the pastor says he's gonna land the plane? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, man. But this is what... What, this, is, this is how Jesus suffered well. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, it tells us that we are to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, the suffering that Jesus endured contained two things. Number one, Jesus suffered, but as he suffered, he suffered for the joy set before him because he trusted and believed 
that his suffering had a purpose. And that on the other side of that, God was going to accomplish something through his suffering that would not be accomplished any other way. And so by faith, Jesus was able to endure suffering and, and, and yet see beyond the suffering for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despised its shame. Do you know they say that one of the biggest differences in those who survived Nazi prison camps and those who didn't was those who survived, they had a term for it, they were able to see beyond the barbed wire. They never stopped envisioning the life beyond the prison camp. For the joy set be, there's something about that. And, and you may be suffering. You may be going through something that you didn't earn and you don't deserve. It may even be the consequences of somebody else's actions. Maybe it's your partner, maybe it's your parent from 25, 30, 40 years ago that you're now realizing the effect that that has had on your life. Maybe it's a boss or a, a neighbor and, and you're having to endure something that you didn't deserve. The way that Noah demonstrated his faithfulness was that even though he didn't see how an ark would save his life, he just kept putting the pieces together because God told him to, trusting that God could see what he couldn't see. Sometimes when you're in the midst of, of those long seasons of suffering, how are you gonna build an ark? Read the scripture. And sometimes you read the scripture in the midst of those long middle seasons and it, it does not feel like it's changing anything, but it's another plank in the ark. It's another piece of something greater. You pray, you come to church, you confide in and walk in authentic relationships. But here's the other thing you can do. You pray this prayer, Lord, would you help me begin to see a glimpse of the future that I can't see for myself? I heard somebody say that they, they, they pray prayers like this because they're, they say, sometimes I'm not sure if I'm asking for the right things, but they pray prayers like this. God, it sure would be amazing to see my marriage restored to a place where there is joy and satisfaction like we've never known. It would just be so incredible to see that. Lord, I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I've been so lonely for so long and I've re refused to compromise and I've not given way to temptation, but I feel like as I walk in obedience to your ways, I just am lonely and lonely and I can't see or envision a future where I have joy in intimate relationship. But God, would you... Open the eyes of my heart to see what I can't see for myself. I'm telling you, some of you just need to ask the Lord to help you dream for your future again, to give you his vision and his eyes to see what you can't see for yourself. Maybe there's people you love that have walked away from the Lord and their lives are a mess and you can't even envision what the road would be like to repair, but you could say, Lord, it would be amazing if you restored joy and freedom and health. Would you help me to get a vision for that that I can't see for myself? For the joy set before. Him. 
But suffering well, the scripture says, receives God's glory. God's glory is revealed when those who love and obey him suffer well. And as I was thinking about that this week, reminded me of, I think, one of the most profound illustrations of what God does through the brokenness that comes through those who suffer well. And it is the art of Kintsugi. Um, anybody heard of that before? I think that's how you say it, Kintsugi. It's where broken pottery is restored and in the, the cracks and the brokenness, um, the artist not only glues it back together, but then fills the cracks with gold. And so it starts like this. There's something that's whole and beautiful and wait, stay on that one for a second. Thank you. It, it's good. And when you think about this in terms of suffering, this is the life that you know. This is the life that you thought was good enough. But in this process, the piece is broken. Next slide into pieces and this is suffering. This is a picture of when your dreams and your hopes, your expectations of what should be gets shattered into pieces. Some of you were there right now. This is all you can imagine. But the next thing the artist does is lays the pieces out and begins to piece them back together. But as you can see, don't go anywhere. As you can see, even as the artist puts the pieces back together, there are still vulnerabilities, holes, cracks, scars that are left from the brokenness that was incurred. But the next step in the process is for the artist to take flecks of gold mixed with an adhesive and begin to paint them into the cracks that were created by the brokenness and create something that many would say is more desirable and more beautiful and certainly more valuable than the original piece was itself. And I don't know of any greater picture of what God will do through the life of someone who chooses to suffer well, to trust, to entrust their souls to God through the midst of the brokenness and the midst of the fire and all the things we use to describe suffering through the losses and the pain and the humiliations and the shame as you walk with God and serve God. And sometimes the suffering that you earned when you repent, there is still a long road of suffering ahead and yet it is a suffering as you walk in obedience that turns from just discipline to actually God beginning to create something that was more valuable and more beautiful than what there was there in the beginning. But the question is, will you yield yourself to the hands of the potter? because broken pieces cannot put themselves back together again. Entrust yourself into the hands of a faithful God. There's no greater example of this than the example of Jesus Christ. If you say, well, that is a hard thing to do. How can I trust God enough to lean into brokenness and lean into suffering and trust him when the floodwaters are rising? How could I do that? The only way you can do that is to look to the one who had enough faith in the Father that he was willing to go to the cross, nailed to the cross, crucified and die all because he was entrusting himself to God and he 
died a literal death and he was entombed. But three days later, God the Father came through on his promise to demonstrate his faithfulness, to raise him up to new life and glory, never to die again. And when you say, that's hard, I don't know if I can do it. You look to Jesus and say, because you did that, I will trust you through this. That's the gospel. promise is that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in those who believe. So how much more? How much more? Because I'm looking at a room full of cracked people that have been, yeah, you know who you are. But when we look at your life, we don't see shattered brokenness. We see something that was more beautiful than what was there in the beginning. So would you entrust yourselves into the hands of a faithful God today, trusting that the same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise you up?